outstanding. Thank you. Uh, Wow, so that, that was, for those of you who didn't see, uh, pretty much everyone was standing, most people were standing. Um, this is typically what, you, what Liz Cheney gets in liberal college towns now, right? <laughs> um, it's a new day. It is a new day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm Mark Leibovich, I'm a reporter for The Atlantic, and you all know Liz Cheney. Thank you all for being here, I saw the, lines like for blocks outside. So apologies to anyone who can't hear me now uh, who didn't get in. But it is indicative of how um, you know, resonant Liz's message has been over the last few years. And um, thanks for being here, Liz. Well, it's wonderful to be here again uh, at, the, at the Texas Tribune and, and here in Austin and of course with you, Mark. So, uh, and, and thank you for that wonderful welcome. Great to be here. All right, well, we have a million questions. Um, we are going to actually, I have a little uh, thing to, I have, I have instructions. If you have questions for our speaker, please submit them to texastribune.org slash ask. And I guess that'll all be curated. And when we come to the end, we will take audience questions. Um, so uh, Liz made a bit of news this week. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those of you who missed it, um, Liz said that she would be voting for Kamala Harris uh, uh, ticket. And my immediate question is, you couldn't have waited two days and given us this story? So, this might be about saving democracy, but really it's about petty, parochial, journalistic, competitive things. Um, I, I guess I would ask you first, what's the response been? Well, um uh, apologies okay. to you, Mark. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, I felt that it was a particularly important um, discussion to have for the first time in North Carolina, where, yeah. um, you know, one of the questions that, that I hear um, from Republicans who know that they, they would not support Donald Trump again um, but, you know, ha have sort of said, well, maybe I'll just write someone in. And I think that particularly when we're talking about states where we know it's going to be close, where the election uh, will be decided, we don't have that luxury. And, and I, I think it's really important to recognize um, uh, the, the nature of the choice that we have. And, and uh, I was telling Mark before that I've, I've heard from a number of um, uh, friends and, and longtime Republicans who um, have said to me, okay, like we obviously we knew we weren't going to vote for Trump, but um, let's take another look at Vice President Harris. And, and, you know, have said, we're listening. We hear what you're saying right. about how important it is, you know, not to, not to throw a vote away here, but to make sure that, uh, that, that we leave no question at all um, about the stakes and about uh, how important it is for Vice President Harris to prevail. So, so t take us through your timing on this. I mean, presumably you had made this decision in your head a while ago, right? I mean, why, why did you decide to come out with this now? Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, Vice President Harris has uh, uh, just become the nominee, right. um, just came through... Uh, both parties' conventions, and uh, I have felt that it, it's very important that that this decision not be viewed as, uh, or because it isn't a political decision. Right. That um, that it's it's a decision that I wanted to be able to talk about, and that I, I reflected on. Um, that's very much based upon my view of what what our duty is. And um, obviously, you know, I have uh, and have had serious policy disagreements um, yeah. 
on a whole range of issues. Uh, you know, not on every issue, certainly, and, right. and we can we can talk about that. But uh, my view very much is that that those of us who believe in the defense of our democracy, in the defense of our constitution, in the survival of our republic, mm -hmm. have a duty in this election cycle to come together to put those things above politics. Right. And um, yeah. and yeah. and I. Um, I look forward to to the days when we will again be having you know debates about tax policy right. and and national security policy and everything else because right. that that will mean that we have made it through what yeah. is right now a very grave threat to to the functioning of the republic. Yeah, yeah the internet has helpfully. Uh uh, provided video of every bad thing you've ever said about Kamala Harris over the next 48 hours. So in case, you know, it's all out there if everyone wants to go. T tell me, was there any talk of you um, speaking at the Democratic Convention? I mean, Adam Kinzinger, your former colleague did, a um, number of Republicans did. Was was that in play at all? You know, my, my view was um, that I, I, first of all, I, I applaud those who did, and I mm -hmm. think that it's very important, and it was, it was very important for the whole country to see on that stage, that platform, right. um, the broad range of policy perspectives and, yeah. and the broad range of leaders from across the country right. um, who have made the decision to put the country ahead of party. Right. Um, and uh, so for me, um, I, I wanted to, um, to make the announcement to, uh, to do it in a way that wasn't connected to um, to the party politics of the moment. Um, I also um, happened to be in London at the Taylor Swift concert. Yeah, I was so. going to say. <laughs> yeah. Certain things are more important than democracy, especially when you have daughters. Um, I know this because my entire family is going to Toronto to see Taylor next month or in November. If you have the chance, to I, go I do see not Taylor, have the chance because they only got four tickets and I'm the fifth. So. It was. Uh, no, I hear it's great. Incredible. Yeah. Really incredible. Because uh, you know, people were tracking her plane, and they were there was a lot of speculation about the surprise guest on the last night of the convention, and Leon Panetta turned out a, a fine American, <laughs> but you know, not quite. Taylor Swift. Um, so, um, all right. So, what, so, uh, what, what do you see your role going forward in the campaign, if anything? I mean, have you thought this through at all? Have you coordinated at all with with the campaign? Or? Well, I'm. Uh, I will be. You know, and I had always planned to be, and I will continue to be um, uh, doing everything I can over the course of the next uh, two months here. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that people realize, understand, recognize um, who Donald Trump is and, and what he did and why he's so dangerous. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a, a campaign surrogate. I'm not, okay. you know, officially, I'm not, you know, uh, technically out there uh, as a surrogate, okay. um, but uh, absolutely going to be um, in, in many key battleground states. Yeah very much focused on uh, how important it is that we defeat him in this cycle. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, you've, you've already done some really big events like this. Like, I mean, there was one in Des Moines. There, there have been all over. So I assume we'll be seeing more things like that where the larger choice, but also democracy will be the main topic of discussion. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I also uh, am going to be talking uh, about how important it is that we elect responsible mm -hmm. and serious people um, up and down the ballot. Uh, yeah. I mean, defeating Donald Trump is is critically important, but you know there are, are numbers of candidates around the country who have embraced um, election denialism, yeah. um, and and I, I think it's really important that we uh, that we defeat them too. And uh, I think that the one of the most important things we need to do as a country as we um, begin to rebuild uh, our politics is we need to elect serious people. Um, and, you know, often when you go in to vote, you don't have, you don't have the choice. You know, there aren't enough good candidates running. I, I want to say specifically, though, here in Texas, you guys do have 
a tremendous, serious candidate uh, running for the United States Senate, and his name is... You're stepping on the news, guys. Let her speak. Let her speak. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. um, it's not Ted Cruz. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Colin Allred um, is um, somebody I served with in the House and somebody who really, when you think about um, the kind of leaders our country needs, um, and going to this point about, you know, you might, you might not agree on every policy position, but we need people who are going to serve in good faith. We need people who are honorable public servants. And, um, and in this race, that is Colin Allred. So I'll be working on his behalf. So we, we have officially made some news here. Uh, let, let's get greedy. Um, Dick Cheney, your father, um, a beloved figure among Democrats uh, for many, many <laughs> years. Uh, do you, uh, if you know who he will be supporting or who he'll be voting for, do you care to share with us who he might be voting for? Dick Cheney will be voting for Kamala Harris. Okay. Wow. Words I never expected to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if you um, uh, think about um, the moment that we're in, and and you think about um, how serious this moment is, um, you know, my dad believes, and he's said publicly that um, there's never been an individual in our country who is as grave a threat to our democracy as Donald Trump is. And, um, and, and that's, that's the moment that we're facing. And so mm -hmm. um, I think recognizing that, um, and, and, and let me also say, you know, um, obviously Vice President Harris and I have had and have policy disagreements on, on some issues, but, um, I have been really impressed um, watching, for example, the Democratic Convention, mm -hmm. um, listening to her speech at that convention, um, learning about her life story, um, learning about you know, uh, the, the story of her success and the, the extent to which it's an American story. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I, I think we all have to walk ourselves back from this, this abyss that we've looked over in our politics and, um, and, and work together um, to build a better future for this country. Yeah. Tell me, how much of the Democratic Convention did you watch? What were some of the other speeches or impressions that you watched, or, or, or speeches you watched or impressions you might have gotten from them? Yeah, I didn't watch um, every moment of it. I, I watched um, more of it than I care to admit. I right. mean, I'll tell you. Yeah. I'm kind of a nerd that way, yeah, um, yeah. but but I um, I think that watching the extent to which um, the party made clear its embrace of love of this country, mm -hmm. and um, and and you know contrasting um, that love of this country, the willingness to um, recognize how important American leadership is in mm -hmm. the world. Con contrasting that with where the Republican Party has gone. I mean, I, you know, it seems on many days that, uh, you know, Donald Trump and, and J.D. Vance are doing everything they can to drive Reagan Republicans away. Right. Uh, and, and they certainly do not reflect um, the, the importance of that Reagan philosophy of mm -hmm. peace through strength and a strong right. national defense. And, and even beyond that, um, you know, you may have seen um, Tucker Carlson's um, embrace of um, pro-Nazi propaganda right. uh, on Monday, um, you know, interviewing an historian who said that, that Churchill was the historian, I put in quotation marks, um, who said 
that Churchill was the chief villain of World War II. Um, and he said that, quote, Hitler didn't want to fight. And, and just, just disgusting garbage mm -hmm. that Tucker Carlson embraced, um, platformed, and I've seen news reports now that yesterday, J.D. Vance sat down and did an interview with Tucker Carlson. Mm. Now, if you, if you appear with Tucker Carlson, if you do an interview with him, as J.D. Vance apparently has, you're endorsing him. You're embracing that. And, and that pro-Nazi propaganda should have no place. It is, it is garbage, and it should have no place in our politics. Yeah. So, so is this, um, so if you, so 2020, there were no real conventions. I mean, they were virtual. Is this the first Republican convention you haven't attended since when? Like, I assume you've been to every one, right? Um, it's, um, I've been to most of them. Uh, the first one that I attended was, um, I think it was 1984. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I was, uh, I was actually a page at that convention. Um, so I was one of the people, we, we came in every night as the convention session opened carrying American flags. And uh, no, I mean, I, um, I've, I've been to, I, mean, I don't think I was at 2016, but, okay. but I've been to the other ones. What, did you watch this year's Republican convention at all, being a nerd? Um, I mean, seriously, I mean, that was yeah. quite a spectacle also. Yeah. No, I did. And... Um, and, and look, I, I think uh, there's just, at the end of the day, um, the idea that, you know, uh, people, it isn't just that the party is trying to kind of whitewash what right. Donald Trump did. Um, you know, the party is embracing it. And, and I, I think one of the things that's also really important for people to remember is, um, you know, January 6th um, would have been a far worse constitutional crisis if Mike Pence had done what Donald Trump was pressuring him to do, you know, illegally, unconstitutionally throw out votes. Right. And J.D. Vance has said clearly and directly that he would have done that. So, um, you know, I, I think every, every Republican, anybody who's contemplating casting a vote for that ticket, um, you know, really needs to think about what they are enabling, what they're embracing, and, and the danger of electing people who um, will only honor election results if they agree with the outcome, yeah. um, and who are, who are willing to set aside the Constitution. Uh, and, you know, uh, in the case of Donald Trump, um, promote, uh, provoke, um, exploit violence yeah. uh, in order to seize power. I mean, we have been talking and watching just this dereliction, frankly, of, of Republicans who know better for a number of years now. I mean, the convention was really next level. I mean, yeah. and granted, the assassination attempt had taken place a couple of days before the start, so that cast a, a very strange energy over everything, and obviously it was a horrific event, and um, but but there was there was just a lot of and there was also a lot of overconfidence too at that moment because Biden hadn't gotten out yet so it was a strange moment I mean I guess you mentioned um, you mentioned Mike Pence how how should we think about him at this point I mean he obviously did the right thing on January 6, 2021 he has said unlike many other Republicans that he would not vote for Donald Trump um, he hasn't gone as far as as what you have done. What's the right way to think about a guy like him? Well, look, I think that every American owes Mike Pence um, just a tremendous debt of gratitude. I, I don't think you can overstate. Um, yeah. You know the 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 courage of what he what he did, and 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 look, we. We knew it on that day, you know, at, at, at midnight, um, after the House and Senate had come back into session uh, on January 6th, I happened to be uh, in Statuary Hall and, and um, 
the vice president was coming through and I had the chance that night to thank him for what he had done. And, and I, I think this is a place to where um, we really need to make sure that we understand the details and the specifics, not, not only of what Donald Trump was doing to attempt to seize power mm -hmm. in the lead up to January 6th, but very specifically what he was doing for 187 minutes while the violence was underway. And, um, you know, the, that includes watching the assault take place on television, watching this mob that he had sent, that he knew was armed, watching them attack and beat police officers. I think Donald Trump today is appearing at the, the Fraternal Order of Police and he will try to convince them that he is pro-law enforcement. And everybody ought to watch the disgusting assault on law enforcement um, by people that he sent to the Capitol that he watched. He knew it was happening. He watched it happen. And instead of telling people to go home, uh, he sent out a tweet saying that Mike Pence was a coward, essentially, didn't have the courage to do what needed to be done, which we know further inflamed the mob and which he knew would further inflame the mob. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just think about from a human perspective, he sat in the dining room next to the Oval Office while his family members were pleading with him to tell the mob to go home, while his senior staff was pleading with him to tell the mob to go home. Um, they told him, they gave him a note that said a civilian had been shot at the door to the House chamber, and he still wouldn't tell the mob to go home. And the idea that you have the President of the United States, whose fundamental constitutional duty is to defend this nation, to ensure that our laws are faithfully executed, that he would watch an assault that he had instigated. He would watch this take place on television. He would ignore the pleas of people to tell the mob to leave. And, and he would do that for over three hours. Like, I don't care what your policy perspective is. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent. You cannot look at that behavior and come to any conclusion other than that is depravity. That is depravity, and you cannot give somebody like that mm -hmm. power ever again. Yeah. So what was it like, for, what were your impressions this summer as you watched the, the drama in the Democratic Party play out? I mean, say, beginning with a debate um, and ending with, I mean, Biden's decision to, to step down. I mean, you know, we were all kind of riveted by that drama. I mean, it wasn't, it was kind of depressing, but what was it like for you? Look, I think that, um, I think that the, the country, as history looks back at this time, um, it will be clear that the country owes a huge debt of gratitude also to President Biden. For stepping and, aside. Well, yeah. for, um, for defeating Donald Trump right. um, and uh, for defending our democracy and then for again you know putting the country ahead of of you know his own political gain i mean it is a very it's a very rare thing for um a politician for a leader to be willing to say I i'm going to give up this tremendous power because i think it's right for the country and and he did that well i i, I think it's um it's really, yeah. 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 anybody else? Yeah. 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 We can throw it open. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. To, to sum up, thank you, Liz. Um, what? Um, so that it, was on camera that you said that, right? No. Did I? I, I was just to, to reflect that I was echoing the crowd. I was sum summarizing helplessly. Um, what? Okay, so we still have a very close race here. So let's let's be current here. Um, if you were 
I mean, this is hypothetical, and but you're not an elected official anymore, so I can ask you hypothetical questions. If you were advising Kamala Harris going into this debate on, I guess Monday, or Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday, with Donald Trump, um, you know, he's not a fun or easy guy to debate. Obviously, um, what? How do you think she should proceed? Yeah. Look, I I think that um, you know uh, every every opportunity. Um, that Donald Trump gets to show the American people who he is. Um, he, he pretty clearly, and look, his running mate is doing this too. I mean, you know, this is my diplomatic way of saying it. Um, they're misogynistic pigs. <laughs> and... Um, and I, I think I think it's um, I think that will become clear. I mean, I think that the Vice President Harris um, has uh, demonstrated, um, you know, particularly if you watch the speech we were talking about at the convention, right. um, a focus on seriousness and substance and policy. Um, and you know, uh, I just I think that that you know, for for people who sort of say, well. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to, if you have conservatives who might say, well, I, I'm thinking of voting for Trump because he's a conservative. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he is not a conservative. Um, and when you, when you look at the contrast in terms of policies, for example, when it comes to things like NATO, when it comes to things like the support of Ukraine, um, when you know you, you look at the proposals that he's made to impose massive tariffs, for example, um, you know I, I think that there there are a whole range of policy issues that raise very serious concerns. But you know um, we would we would sometimes you hear from Trump supporters that, that you know they want to just let Trump be Trump, and like I endorse that, like let that guy go, because <laughs> the more people see him, and the more you know, frankly. At the end of the day, I think that that women around this country, like we've had enough. We've had enough, and um, and I think what that means is that people have got to step up and and realize. I mean, again, look at what JD Vance says on an almost daily basis about women. I mean, that guy's got a real women problem. I don't know what it is, and I don't want to psychoanalyze him. Um, and there's a lot of eyeliner jokes to be made in there. But, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if you listen to what he says about women, um, you know, and you look at Donald Trump and what Donald Trump has done and what he says about women, these, these are not people that we can entrust with power again. But that means women and men. But we, we've got to get out there and vote. We've got to make sure people are registered. You've got to drive people to the polls. Um, it really, really matters this time. Right. See, I mean, what you're saying is, I mean, you're going beyond protecting democracy here. I mean, this is a very different thematic lane than we, I have heard, I and mean, I've heard you say similar things before, but I guess if you are a woman debating Donald Trump, and, you know, he might be a misogynistic pig, but how, there are perils as a woman on that stage, as Hillary Clinton learned, and, and as she learned given the results of that election. I mean, are there certain things she should avoid doing? I mean, obviously, she'll, she'll do what she I, I does. Think, well, I mean, what we've seen is that, that the thing that Donald Trump really doesn't know how to handle right. is, is a strong, competent, serious woman. He right. really, it, it throws him. And right. so I think that, that you know, I, I think the vice president will do just fine. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I said, you know, the... The American people will have a chance not just at that debate, but throughout this campaign to see right. who he is. Right. Uh, and we know, we know what he has done. And, um, and I, I think that you know, it's not a difficult choice. I, I want to ask you this. Is, is Trump in any trouble from the right? I mean, we know he's, I, I agree that he's not a conservative, especially on things like Ukraine, things like tariffs, things like you know, deficit reduction, things like that. But I mean, he's been all wobbly all over the place on, you know, say abortion the last um, 
you know, how many, a few weeks in particular, I mean, are you sensing at all that, that people who have been a very reliable part of his base, I mean, over the last few years, I mean, not, not people who didn't jump off in 2016 might be ready to stay home? Because there have been some rumblings out of people like Pence, people from the evangelical right who have said, I mean, enough already. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think you're starting to see that. I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what what he demonstrated was, um, you know, fundamentally a willingness to um, conduct himself in a way that violated what I think is the, the most conservative of all conservative principles, which is fidelity to the Constitution. And um, so, yes, I mean, I think when, you know, some of my, my friends who, for example, are national security hawks, um, you know, we've never before since the existence of NATO had a president of the United States of either party who has invited Russia to invade our NATO allies. And, and I think that, you know, though people really do need to stop and focus on what he's saying and what he represents. Um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, the, the biggest reason why he can't be president again is, is the danger that he poses. Right. To the republic. Um, back to current events. What, what did you make of the DOJ charges um, against the you know, just the Russian either media influencer connection that we've seen sort of um, laid out in the last few days? Yeah, I mean, look, I I think it's 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 very serious. It's very important. It's you know something that um, is not a surprise. We know that the Russian government has been involved in and has you know. We've had indictments previously uh, involved in, in attempting to influence the outcome of our elections. Um, I think that that you know, in this particular instance, the fact that there were it looks like significant payments being made. Now the individuals who apparently were receiving the payments have said they they didn't know that they were coming from the Russians. I mean, it was just like magic apparently, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but I, I you know I, I think it's important to take it seriously and important to realize uh, that w there are adversaries um, who are doing everything they can to try to sow chaos and, yeah. and division. Um, but it it also points to you know another really troubling development inside the Republican Party, which is how many elected Republicans are pro Putin. And, and, you know, it's not a majority, but, but people willing to espouse sort of Putin's view of the world, and I put J.D. Vance for sure in this category. Um, and, and I think we, we, again, you know, these things matter. We need to make sure that, that we understand and recognize the effort that's underway here um, to, uh, to influence uh, this election in a way that results in the outcome that that the Russians yeah. and other adversaries would prefer. Did you did you overlap in Congress with um, Tim Walls? Um, I don't. I mean, maybe briefly. Yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't, you know don't know that him we or, work together. Yeah. What, what do you think of his? How he's been since he was named? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, that that the extent to which. Um, He's been uh, effective out there on the campaign trail, has yeah. been impressive. Um, uh, I, um, I did not like, I disagreed with um, the answer that he gave yesterday, um, I believe it was yesterday, when he was asked about October 7th. And mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that, uh, that it's very important for us to recognize um, the the extent to which, mm -hmm. you know, talking about October 7th without mentioning Hamas mm -hmm. by name um, is not an accurate reflection of, of, of the challenges that, that we face and of, of the attack and the assault on Israel. Uh, okay. Um, have you uh, talked to Kamala Harris since, well, ever, uh, but, but also <laughs> especially this week um ever yes this week no 
This week, no. Okay. Uh, would you serve in a Harris Walls administration I'm, if asked? I'm not. Uh, not going to uh, make news on that. Today? I'm. <laughs> we made a lot of news we here have. today, Mark. No. Yeah. Um, look, I'm. I am uh, not focused on that. I am very much focused on we have to make sure that that mm -hmm. uh, we defeat Donald Trump in November. But. While we are trying to sort of amass a ledger of news made today, you are endorsing Tim Walls for vice president. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, got to keep score here. Um, before we get to questions, I have a few scenarios I want to lay out, and I'd like to get your your thoughts on. So it's November fifth. That's the election, right? November fifth. You guys should know this. When is the election? Okay. Um, okay. So a couple of scenarios. Say Donald Trump after, say, 72 hours after the polls close, it's clear that he has won the presidency. Um, and it could happen. I mean, the polls are very close. But what, it's not going to happen. What, and I know what you're going to ask. Okay. But. I, it could happen. I mean, and you know this. Well, that's, we this is, that's why we, we have to work so hard to make sure that it I, doesn't happen. I want to ask you, I guess hypothetically, what goes through your mind, though? Because, I mean, obviously the country is not going to stop if that takes place. I mean, what is the correct and responsible and what are things that people should be concerned about if that were to come to pass? And then I'll ask you other scenarios. Well, I mean, I think this, uh, he, he's not going to win because we're going to make sure that people are mobilized and they get out to vote. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that part of making sure that people are mobilized is talking about what a second Trump term would look like. And, um, you know, the, again, this is a place where uh, I have Republican friends who will say, well, our institutions will protect us. You know, we don't we don't have to worry, and it, that that is um, that's that's not true. Um, and and I think if you just sort of walk through um, what we would see in a second Trump term, and and he has said much of this. You know, um, we know that there were people who served in the first Trump administration who prevented him from doing the worst that he wanted to do in a number of instances. And we know that those are the people Donald Trump does not want serving in a second Trump administration. Um, you know, he talks about putting people like Cash Patel, for example, in leadership positions, uh, you know, in the Defense Department or at the CIA. Um, people like Mike Flynn, who Mike Flynn, uh, in December of 2020, on television, said that Donald Trump uh, should should deploy the military to seize voting machines in swing states and rerun the election. Um, and so the people that he would have around him uh, are not people that would, would be in any way trying to stop his worst right. inclinations. Um, he said he won't abide by the rulings of the courts. We, we see right now that he's gone to war with the, the justice system. He's gone to war with the rule of law. Um, and, and let me just say some, a, a point with respect to um, his trial for uh, the January 6th related charges. Um, he is working so hard to make sure that the testimony that uh, occurred in front of the grand jury, um, testimony that he has seen, you know, through discovery, he is, he, he's got all of the testimony. Now, the select committee was able to present a lot of evidence, but the special counsel has secured even more. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump is working every day to hide that from the American people. Mm -hmm. This effort to delay um, beyond the election, um, to prevent any disclosure of the testimony in front of the grand jury, and it, it is, fundamentally important in my view that the American people see that testimony, that they understand that they see what those who were working for Donald Trump said about his actions. Okay. Um, and, and that gives you an insight into how he views the justice system. Uh, you know, our, our courts, have, they don't have an enforcement mechanism. If, if the president is unwilling to enforce the rulings of the courts, then we're not a nation of laws. And, and that is something that you would see happen mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. almost immediately um, or immediately. Right. Um, of course, you know, people say, well, maybe the, the Congress will stop him. But um, like you name me a Republican member of Congress that you really think is going to step up and, and stop him. He will ignore the need to get uh, his appointees confirmed. He'll appoint people in acting positions. Um, so, you, you know, you can go down the list, um, you know, again and pardon again and power. again. He'll, he'll be, he'll pardon assume. power. He will, you know, anybody that's, who says that, you know, they're concerned about carrying out something that he's asked that they do, he'll, he'll offer up pardons. He said he wants to completely um, uh, eliminate um, major parts of the career civil service so that uh, you only have people who support him in office. So, um, and again, you know, he, I think the idea that, that he would leave office is a fantasy. Right. Uh, and so all of those things, I, I, I do think people really need to sit down and think through what would it mean to put this depraved human being in the most powerful office in the world and, right. and why that's a risk we can't take. So, um, okay, before I get to scenario two, I just, I want to plug, you mentioned Cash Patel. The Atlantic has a piece by my colleague Elena Plott, who's here, I don't know if she's here, but she's in Austin. Uh, it's tremendous, everyone who doesn't know who Cash Patel is should read that. Um, so that's my plug. Scenario two, um, Kamala Harris wins by say three, four percentage points. Uh, the networks declare her the victor within a few days of election day. Trump he does not concede, as he didn't last time. What goes through your mind when, you know, you're obviously encouraged by the result of the election, but we have this situation that obviously has echoes to four years ago. How should we think about that if that comes to pass? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, uh, first of all, it's one of the reasons why it's so important that that margin of victory be as large as possible, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you already can can hear Donald Trump talking about um, the fact that, you know, the election will be sure. rigged if he doesn't win. Um, so I think that's very important. I think mm -hmm. that um, making sure that um, we, you know, people uh, are volunteering as poll watchers, that, mm -hmm. that people are at the polls, that people are prepared for the fact that, you know, um, there will be efforts after the fact um, to try to steal the election if if he loses. Now, uh, I think on one hand, um, we are, uh, it will be a different situation than it was in 2020 because he's not in he's power. Not in the White House, right. And so that means that he, you know, he doesn't have control of the levers of power um, in, in the way that he did. Um, but Mike I, Johnson might be. Or right. Really I mean, I think right. that's, it's, it, again, it goes to this point about right. Um, what can happen then on January 6th. Right. And you've already, you know, I've seen Trump campaign officials say things like, well, the election doesn't really end until January 20th, until Inauguration right. Day, which that's wrong, that's unconstitutional. We've put some changes into place, which are good changes, mm -hmm. um, through um, the Electoral Count Reform Act that we passed. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to have a larger number of members of the House and Senate um, uh, object in order to um, have a debate about electoral yeah. votes. In my view, there's no basis for any objection um, in Congress uh, that, you know, Congress does not have um, the right to act as a sort of court of last resort. Mm -hmm. uh, once you have had governors of the states certify those election results, which, you know, they do um, far before January 6th ever happens. And, and this is another, another thing for people to remember here in Texas uh, about Ted Cruz. And, um, you know, the, Ted Cruz uh, led the effort on the Senate side to um, attempt to throw out votes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, there, there's an audio recording of Ted Cruz talking to Maria Bartiromo. Uh, I believe it's on January 2nd, uh, 2021, where he's explaining to her 
his concept for uh, basically how uh, Congress is going to be able to reject certified electoral votes. And Bartiromo says to him, do you really think you're going to be able to overturn this? Do you think you're going to be able to overturn this? And according to reports of this discussion, this audio tape, Ted Cruz's response is, I hope so. Hmm. So to have someone who is, you know, on January 2nd, it was clear um, you had certified electors from every one of the 50 states. There were no legitimate contested slates of electors. And he was saying uh, that he hoped to be able to overturn the election. Um, you know, that, that is not somebody that you can put in a position to be able to do that again. So, before we get to questions, I want to, scenario three, which is a more hopeful scenario uh, from where we started. Harris wins, Trump eventually, you know, his appeals are exhausted and everyone's exhausted, and he goes away. Um, do you think that this could be the thing that changes the Republican Party or reverts it to some direction that is more familiar to the Liz Cheney's that came up in these ranks? Yeah, I mean, I, um, look, I, I think a couple of things. I, I think that um, coming through this period of time, mm -hmm. um, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent, um, realizing uh, how important it is for us to rethink how we conduct ourselves in politics is so important. And, you know, uh, I'm as guilty of uh, partisan attacks, I have been, as, as anybody. Um, and I, I think it it's really matters. You know, if you look at all of the challenges that, that we're facing as a nation, committing ourselves that we are going to have debates and discussions that are much more focused on substance, where we actually listen to each other. Um, you know, trying again to sort of say, let's we're going to reject the toxicity. And like, I'm I'm not naive um, about how difficult that might be, but but I I think that Democrats and Republicans both have a really important role to play in that. Everybody does, and you know, um, when you think about a Harris administration. Um, you know, because the coalition that uh, has come together is a coalition across the political spectrum mm -hmm. working to make sure that she is elected, mm -hmm. the responsibility then that she will have and that I, I believe that she knows she has is to be a president for all Americans and to have policies that reflect um, the reality that all Americans face. and. Um, and I think that's a that's a hugely important step to take. And and I think as as someone who has been a Republican, who is a conservative, um, you know, being part of getting back to a place where we we have you know two parties in this country right. that are based on on substance and policy is it's you know crucially important for the health of our democracy. Um. Okay, uh, so th there was a guy who was going to come out here with a phone who was good. Here we go. Here's the guy. Um, here, take it from here. Uh, these are from uh, the audience. The first one is, young conservatives have grown up thinking Donald Trump is the GOP. How do Republicans in their 20s show that not every conservative is like Trump? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really important question, and and the way that that young people have to do it is by speaking out, by being um, engaged, by um, educating yourselves about policy and thinking about you know why uh, why you're advocating for conservative policies. Um, I think it's also really important for people to educate themselves about the history of our country and and to you know we. Uh, need to do a better job as adults at helping to educate our young people about um, you know, about fundamental civics concepts and and how the Constitution's structured and why and why it matters, um, but also about you know what heroic people have done in this country 
um, what our men, in uniform, men and women in uniform um, do every day uh, to defend us and why it matters and why America is exceptional and why we're different. And, and I think, you know, if, if we need to make sure our young people are learning that in school, but if you're not learning it in school, um, I think, you know, reading history, getting hold of biographies, finding, you know, lessons that you can about, about leaders in the past and, and understanding what it takes to defend the country uh, is, is so important. If Trump loses, what do you think the future of the national GOP looks like? Looks a lot brighter. Uh, should Democrats be worried that their party's platform is a barrier to uh, Republicans or former Republicans who no longer feel like the GOP is a place they can call home? Look, I think that, um, I, I think it's really important, um, you know, in this cycle, and it's good for the country, um, for, um, for both parties to reject um, the fringes, and I think that um, it's not the same challenge, obviously, you know, the, the sickness that pervades the Republican Party is unique, um, but, but I, I do think that the Democratic Party has a responsibility um, to be a welcoming home for, um, you know, people who understand that they can't be part of what the Republicans are doing, but they want to know um, that you know they they can be part of something that is responsible and that truly does reflect um, you know the substance and policy and not just sort of partisan politics. What do you think Democrats are missing with rural voters that Republicans are not? You know. Um, I think, and I look at this, you know, from, from the perspective of, of Wyoming in particular, um, you know, and Wyoming is different from Texas in, in, this, in this regard. In Wyoming, over 50% of the land in the state is owned by the federal government. And so policies that are made in Washington, D.C. have a huge impact on you know, people who, every place, this isn't just in Wyoming, but you know, if you're trying to graze cattle on federal land, um, if you're involved in the energy industry, um, there, there are a whole range of areas where, you know, it, 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 people in Washington make decisions that, that can have really devastating consequences and repercussions. And the feeling of not being heard by Washington, the feeling that um, unelected individuals are making those decisions. That's a that's a real and legitimate concern. And Donald Trump tapped into that in a way that, you know, he's lying and he's betraying people. But but he's effectively tapped into people feeling like they aren't heard. And I I think listening to um, people who you know are are trying every day to make a living and, and are finding that um, made impossible in some cases by the federal government and changing policies to reflect that we, we understand and we hear you and, and um, you know, we're, we're not trying to, the, the federal government needs to be understood as you know, something in my view that needs to be limited in its ability to, to have that impact on people's lives. What message do you have for Texas voters who feel disencouraged by the state leadership's embrace of Trump? <laughs> Vote for Colin Allred. <laughs> How do you combat, combat the fact that even if Donald Trump loses, his ideology and dangerous rhetoric is still there and it's being pushed by many people still in the party? Yeah, I think it's a it's a really important question, and and um, and I think a big part of it is all of us as voters realizing how serious this endeavor is, and you know if if you are somebody operating on the fringes of the Republican Party, well, it's not the fringes anymore. If you are somebody who you know 
um, has been elected to Congress and you know, you think that your job every day is to get as many likes as possible on social media, for example, and you say the craziest things you can imagine, those people get a lot of, of positive reinforcement. And too often, the, the serious people sort of say, my God, I don't want any part of this. And, um, and the, the voters also say, this is, I, they just turn it off. And, and so what I would say is the only way we can change it is for the voters to understand no, this really matters. You, you don't have the luxury of saying, I'm gonna ignore politics. You don't have the luxury of saying, uh, you know, I'm not gonna vote in this election. Um, we need people to also put their name on the ballot, to run for office, to understand that you cannot elect people that you wouldn't hire. Like you can't make somebody, I mean, like, if you wouldn't trust someone, like, to babysit your kids, you probably shouldn't elect them president. It's like, What can or should people be doing uh, to combat efforts right now to uh, cast doubts on, on this election? Yeah. Um, I think uh, speaking out against those efforts um, if, you know, for elected officials, and if, if you look at, at sort of the, um, the mechanics of our elections and you listen to what you know, the Department of Homeland Security and CISA, the, the entities in the federal government that are responsible for ensuring the security of the elections, um, you know, they will tell you that, that, that our election process and our election system uh, is secure, and they're working on it around the clock to make sure that it stays that way. Um, Elected officials need to recognize and they need to speak out and they need to say, you know, when individuals, Donald Trump and others, say, well, democracy doesn't work, our system's broken, you know, uh, our, our, our country has dissolved into a situation where, you know, the democratic process is sick. Number one, those are lies. And number two, it's exactly what the Chinese Communist Party says about democracy. It's what our adversaries say about democracy. They're, they're echoing the things that America's enemies say. And those of us who know it isn't true have a responsibility to stand against it. We also have an obligation, and this is a place where there's bipartisan support, to make sure we're doing things like protecting poll workers, um, that, that we are absolutely rejecting violence as any part of our political process. And we need to be clear in a bipartisan basis that that's the case. And then last one, how many Republican elected officials have reached out to you to thank you since you made your announcement that you were supporting Harris? Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of the definition of thank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I've heard from more than you would imagine. Um, and, um, you know, the, look, uh, we're in a partisan election season, um, but, uh, but I do think, you know, as I said before, that in this cycle, Republicans really, you know, all Americans, but Republicans really do need to think about how, how am I gonna vote that actually puts this country ahead of partisanship? And, um, and I think you will, you will have more do that than, than you can imagine right now. Right. Um, oh, he's gone. Um, so this is great. Uh, we have 50 seconds left. Um, it is a, it's a point of personal privilege, and I have the mic now. It is a total pleasure to, to interview Liz, to get to talk to her. Uh, she's one of the more compelling figures that we get to cover these days. Thank you for making uh, B, C list news with us. No, good news. There you go. And, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be watching. It's obviously a huge fault. Thank so. you. Wonderful to be with you, and, and you. great to be here.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks.